In this video, we'll talk about different ways to evaluate a model. One very common way to assess the quality of a model fit is to measure a quantity called the coefficient of determination, usually denoted as capital R squared. To define it, we need a few preliminaries. We define averages as before with the bar over the corresponding letter. And the residuals, sometimes called the errors, denoted by E. These are the difference between the observation Y and the model prediction F. Now we define three quantities. First, the total sum of squares, which measures the total variability in the output. Next, the residual sum of squares, which is the sum of the squared residuals. This is a measure of the overall difference between the model predictions f and the observations y. Earlier, we called it q, and it was the thing we tried to minimize. Finally, we have the explained sum of squares. This is a measure of how much variation there is in the model values. Finally, we can define the coefficient of determination as 1 minus the ratio of the residual sum of squares to the total sum of squares. For a model which exactly fits the observations, the residual sum of squares will vanish, and r squared equals 1. For a very bad model, which always predicts the average value of y for any input, then RSS equals TSS and R squared is 0. Hence, for good models, which closely match the data, R squared will be close to 1, and for bad models it will be close to 0. When we have a linear model, we can say a lot more about the variance than R squared. If we start with this simple relationship, adding and subtracting the model prediction to the difference between an observation and the average output, then square both sides and sum over all observations, if we recall our definition from earlier, this says the total sum of squares is equal to the residual sum of squares plus the explained sum of squares plus another term. It can be shown that if f is a linear fit and we evaluate the parameters using least squared estimation, then the final term vanishes. If you want a very difficult exercise, you can try to prove this statement. If you try, you might find this relationship useful, as well as looking back to the previous lectures where we gave a formula for the least squares estimate of alpha. Using this relation, we can see the total variation is split into two parts, the explained sum of squares, which is the variance explained by the model, plus the residual sum of squares, the variance not explained by the model. We can also write R squared in the form of ESS over TSS. High R squared corresponds to high ESS, that is, most of the variance is explained by the model. In fact, R squared turns out to be identical to the square of the correlation coefficient. Remember, this decomposition is only true for a linear model. You can also compute R squared for a nonlinear model where these relationships do not hold. Part of the reason you might want to do a data transformation instead of a nonlinear fit is because there are so many nice relationships like this for linear models. Here's an example of a linear regression on some data. The R squared value is 0.74. Here I've plotted the total sum of squares for this fit next to the explained and residual sum of squares. First, you can see they are in fact equal, and second, here we see about 25% of the variation in the data is not explained by the model. A different way to evaluate a model is using something called Bayesian Information Criterion. There are a number of similar metrics, the most popular alternative is the aka ik Information Criterion, but they both work in a similar way. The Bayesian Information Criterion is k times the natural log of n minus twice the log likelihood of the model. Here n is the number of data points and k is the number of parameters. Hopefully n and k make sense to you now, but the likelihood might require some more explanation. Formally, the likelihood is the probability of the data given the model and the values of the fit parameters theta. So for a linear model, these would be slope and intercept, but they could be anything depending on the model. If the model is very good, we expect that the probability of generating the data from that model is high, so the likelihood is high. This L is basically another measure of goodness of fit. Bayesian information balances having a good quality fit, that is large L, against how many parameters we require to obtain that fit quality. Remember, L is a probability, then the maximum value is 1. This means log of L is less than or equal to zero, so the second term will cancel the minus sign and BIC should always be positive. Also keep in mind that a worse model will have a lower probability, so the log likelihood will be large and negative. And when we multiply by minus two, this will give a big contribution to the BIC. To get some intuition for BIC, let's look at a linear model. We calculate the likelihood by recalling that the residuals are supposed to be normally distributed with mean zero and constant variance. This means the probability to measure a given residual should be given by the usual formula for a Gaussian function. The likelihood is then the product of the probabilities for all the residuals. Remember, they're supposed to be independent so we can multiply them together. A bit of algebra gives us this expression in terms of the residual sum of squares. A bit more algebra gives us this expression. Small RSS gives a low BIC, and generally we want our models to minimize the Bayesian information criterion. You might be thinking, for linear regression, k is always 2, so what's the point here? As we'll cover in the workshop, it is possible to do a multiple linear regression, predicting the output by combining many different inputs. In this case, the BIC gives us a way to balance using a lot of predictor variables to get a very good fit, that is low RSS, versus overfitting, that is high K. As an example, let's say we have two models, one with log likelihood lambda that uses two parameters, and the other with twice the log likelihood but using twice as many parameters. Let's also say there are 30 measurements. 
Computing the difference in BIC, we get 6.8 minus 2 times lambda. Remember, L is a probability, so its maximum is 1, hence the maximum of lambda is 0, and the difference is always positive, so model 2 is always inferior under this criterion. Generally, BIC harshly punishes extra parameters that don't increase the model likelihood by a lot. So, to be worth increasing the number of parameters by 1, we have to add an additional factor of at least log n over 2 to lambda, or, in terms of the likelihood itself, the probability of the data given the model, this has to increase by a factor of the square root of n.